really just a, an introduction at this uh, uh, stage, but I, di I did want to just cover, you know, a little bit of exactly what we do at the NXCT, and then I'll go into some examples of how actually we can use that as a, as a starting point for actually producing large data sets and like being able to investigate some of these ideas. So I'll give an overview of what NXCT does and then go on to explain uh, just a very brief introduction about actually what X-ray imaging, uh, the power of X-ray, maybe that should say X-ray imaging uh, there. Um, and uh, again, a very basic introduction to how X-ray CT works and the novel methods that are starting to add different dimensions, different scales, and then how that all feeds into some of the big data challenges that we've got. So the NXCT is a, is a partnership between the Manchester University at the hub, but Diamond Light Source, uh, UCL, University of Southampton and University of Warwick at WMG. And we're all making available our uh, equipment in CT scanning because we're here to support UK research and we're funded by EPSRC, but actually, our remit is to help any area of research. So whether that is biological or medical, it doesn't have to be directly related to the sort of core activities of the EPSRC. So we can really support any academic, institutional or industrial uh, research going on in the UK. And it's our mission to provide access to X-ray CT scanners. So if you don't have your own scanner, that's something that we can make available and we can actually fund your access to, to the scanners in our facility. But also we can make available data sets and we can make available experimental information. And again, we're trying to push the capabilities. And I think what we realized in setting up this meeting is that whilst there are some specific things that we can achieve with X-ray imaging, actually the, the, the challenges that we have around our data is something that really uh, is, is a much more generic issue that we want to tackle. So one of those areas that is uh, growing very quickly for us is that the new capabilities that we're developing in color or hyperspectral imaging and phase contrast imaging means we're adding additional dimensions to our data. And this is rapidly growing the total size of the data that we're collecting and making it more complex. So we need special approaches to handle this. And again, we can use X-ray CT data here as a, like a use case for a lots of the general uh, um, uh, challenges. Another thing that I wanted to mention is that we will be hosting a, a library of in situ rigs. This has just started to be like come into like a, become a reality. And these are rigs that you'll be able to use in the NXCT, but also um, borrow and take to synchrotron experiments or bring into your own lab. So all of the different rigs have got slightly different requirements and like uh, uh, access, um, but that's something that again, we'll make available. So all of these facilities of our scanners at our facilities are available and there's over 20 in total and they cover a huge range of different scales. And like I mentioned, we can actually pay for your access to use these scanners. So there's some details here about, please get in touch with us uh, about um, doing this. And uh, here's also the, the link to make an application, but all of these details are actually included in your like registration pack as well. So you need to uh, uh, find them down now. So yeah, please get in touch and uh, see what we can do to help you. And here I wanted to emphasize how we actually use X-ray scanning is just a starting point really to identify regions of interest. So it might be that you want to do something completely different with your sample or your information, but the X-ray CT creates this 3D map to allow you to navigate to something that you're really interested in. This example is a stainless steel wire that has been corroded and these pits have appeared on the surface. So as I play the video, I'll just talk through it. So we pitted this sample and we actually could choose which pit was growing fastest or slowest. And actually this is one that is like more average. And then we did a high resolution region of interest scan using uh, X-ray CT. And now this is an SEM image of the surface of that pit. And you can see it's actually got a cover. It's a lacy cover on the pit. 
But now, as we look at the virtual cross sections, we can see below the surface and actually choose this region of interest. And now we're using FIB serial sectioning in the SEM to look in very high resolution at one of the tips of this corrosion front. So again, we've used the CT to really target this region of interest. But it doesn't stop there because we're able to still pull out from this location where we know exactly where it is with reference to this pit, this corrosion damage. And we can actually now map the crystallography here using um, transmission Kikuchi diffraction. And now we're at a 50 nanometer scale when the original resolution was a, a few microns. And also using TM EDX, we can map the chemistry of this location. And you can see how minute that region of interest is compared to the whole uh, sample overall. So this ability of CT to non-destructively survey samples and um, different uh, components and different uh, materials is really a starting point, a non-destructive starting point to really go in and probe specific things that you're interested in. And it's the case that if you look here across the whole range of scales from the meter down to the atomic scale, it's actually, you can use X-ray CT to really cover a huge range of scales, but we do need to put in some thought about how we actually cover this range of scales. And we can use destructive techniques of imaging to go alongside this, but it, machining techniques here are critical to being able to access these different volumes. But ultimately it's often something like the chemistry or the crystallography or the performance. This doesn't have to be mechanical. It could be any type of electrical or chemical or other performance that we really want to understand. And actually X-ray CT can play a really important role in terms of, if I want to understand the nanoscale chemistry of a material actually, but the component I've got is, you know, a centimeter sized object, how am I gonna like navigate from this overall sample right down to that nanoscale like chemistry. So here with these non-destructive approaches is a way of actually achieving that and guiding the, 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 the investigation. Okay. And I think the other thing that is so important and so powerful about X-ray CT, I've got two examples here of, you don't need to touch your sample. And in fact, you can actually preserve your sample or create an environment for your sample that is exactly what it should be. So we've got two extreme examples. Here on the left, we've got an example of radioactive nuclear graphite. So not only does it have to be in a container to sort of contain the radiation, but it's also going up to 600 degrees under compression load. So it's an extremely aggressive environment, which is replicating those in-service conditions. And again, there's really no limit to what kind of environment that you can create and then image with the X-ray uh, imaging, uh, what is going on inside. But another example in now a much more like um, subtle environment is just actually preserving the environment needed to actually grow this seedling here. And at the top, you can see how the leaves of this seedling are growing and how it's possible using X-ray CT to maintain the temperature, humidity, and keep the dose low enough that you're not gonna destroy what, what you're looking at. So again, you can really look at what it is you want to look at that, whether that is tissue or an engineering component or something else and preserve exactly what the environment that needs to be in to, to, to understand it. So, Again, we'll use it as an example, which has got its own demands to really take advantage of the, or uh, like really exploit the huge amounts of data, but it's very powerful for 3D and 4D imaging, which is non-destructive, can really be used on any material preserving the environment that it needs. And it can work from the nanometer scale to the meter scale. So we've got scanners within the NXCT that uh, can achieve a 50 nanometer resolution, but the new equipment coming will allow us to scan two meter sized objects and it allows us to zoom into those regions of interest and what we're doing what i mentioned very quickly at the start is that we're actually adding these different dimensions so we're adding chemical information through hyperspectral imaging and we're adding crystallographic information through diffraction so again this is really adding complexity but adding a huge amount of information to uh, what, what we're gathering this means big data and big data challenges. So 
Now, I'll just give a very brief introduction for those uh, of you that maybe are not so familiar with the technique itself. But essentially what we have in the lab is slightly different from the synchrotron, but we have a point source of X-rays. And this creates a cone beam of X-rays, which illuminates the sample. And then we record our image, which is essentially in absorption contrast, a density map. So the higher density regions of the sample basically absorb or scatter more X-rays so that you get a lower number of photon counts on your detector. So we essentially get a density map. And when we take one image, this is just the same as if you get an X-ray of your hand or arm in the, in the hospital, what we do is we rotate the sample and typically take thousands, hundreds or thousands of images, maybe 3000 images might be typical um, of, of the specimen as it's rotated 360 degrees. And so that's our raw data and it's all a transmission view of our specimen. So that's where we get this projection or radiograph data. And then we have to go through this um, stage of reconstruction. And the reconstruction basically turns that raw data into now a virtual replica of your sample. So this is why it's called computed tomography because we have to compute these slices. So the tomography is tom is the same as atom, which is cannot be cut, but tom is like a cut or a slice and actually the computed slices. So we're computing our slices, which is now a serial stack of slices, which is a, a 3D replica of our sample reconstructed from this transmission data. And it's once we've got that virtual replica of our sample that we can carry out all of this visualization and analysis. And also in a lot of cases, prepare a, a, a volume or a replica of a component for modeling. So that could be FE modeling to understand like the stress strain behavior, or it could actually be modeling of the flow or the permittivity or another uh, property uh, that we, we want to understand uh, through that now that we've got an exact virtual replica of, of, of what we've scanned. So just to say a little bit more here about, um, uh, about how reconstruction, which is like really like an intensive, like uh, um, sort of application of the sort of algorithms that we need. And what is described here is how we might need what was said here is the number of projections down the left-hand side of this image series. And here at the top are some different reconstruction methods. So this is detailed in this uh, paper by Sophia Coburn. And he can show you that actually you can get away, if you use a thousand projections, you get great results with all of these techniques. But actually, as you can see for this FDK, which is our standard back projection uh, reconstruction method, the results get worse and worse as we reduce the number of projections. But you can actually see if you use a special reconstruction method like this TV prior, you can actually get a very, very good uh, quality reconstruction from a quarter of the number of projections. But you can see there's a penalty here in terms of how long, which is uh, like annotated on the actual lines themselves, how long those reconstruction methods take to, to get you that result. I also mentioned adding different dimensions. So it's something that we're set up to do, we're as part of the NXCT building a the first lab based color scanner. And what that will mean is that we'll have an energy sensitive detector where we're actually recording at each pixel the energy of all the uh, photons that are arriving at that, uh, at that pixel. And what that allows us to do is build up a spectrum of uh, all of the energy of the uh, photons hitting that pixel. And that allows us to do through various different methods, uh, an elemental map of, of the sample. And again, we can do that using CT where we actually rotate the sample 360 degrees and take a series of images and reconstruct that. This is a huge, I'll, I'll touch on how much data this creates later, but it creates a huge amount of data and a huge challenge for how you actually really efficiently and effectively like tackle a data set like this. We also are using a combination of standard absorption contrast imaging, which mapping the density and X-ray diffraction, where, which can allow us 
to map the crystallography of the sample. So here we can actually look at the crystal of crystalline orientation of all of these grains inside this sample using this diffraction contrast tomography method. So we're adding these huge numbers of dimensions and huge size to the data when we do this. Just wanted to say a quick word about once we have our data, so we've got this 3D volume of data, we still got a long way to go to actually extract the meaning from it in terms of how do we quantify that data? Because sometimes it's enough to see an image and go, oh, there's a defect in that region, or I can see that there's this phase is next to this phase. But in other times, we really want to go through this process of segmentation where we work together with the computer to actually identify the different phases. So in this sample, it's a metal sample with some porosity in it. And then we've got the black uh, air uh, around it. But actually you can see that as I try to identify the porosity in the sample, which is in the center of this sample, I'm actually selecting lots of noise as well, which is really not interesting at all. And there's lots of challenges if you look here in the bottom left in terms of how do I accurately do this job in terms of identifying the things that I want to see and disregarding the things that are irrelevant. And this is a very, very simple example because it's just like two phases, metal and air. But when you have complex multi-phase systems, this is increasingly challenging. And especially for a lot of biological materials where you have like gradients of density and things characterized by shape. Now Martin will talk a, uh, a lot more about actually ways to tackle these very complex seg segmentation routines. Because the real power of this is that once we've identified this, we'll turn, in this case, our grayscale image into essentially a binary image, where now we've just got a background and then all of the porosity here identified as, as, as a separate phase. And it's at that point that we can start to extract lots of quantities from our data. So we can look at the size, volume, surface area of these things. We can look at the exact position. And then we can also do more complex thing to look at the connectivity of these regions and what is the relationship between shape and position. And we can create heat maps. So there's a huge amount of analysis that can be very relevant. And this is something that's very interesting for a lot of additive manufactured materials as we try and understand the defects that are, are being established in these newly built materials. Okay, another example here of time-lapse data. So this is some work uh, Jose Godinho did in, in the facility, and he's looking at flowing two different um, solutions into this uh, sandstone and when they meet, they actually precipitate out these crystals and we can watch the crystals grow. So as well as tracking a whole series of 3D data, so we've got this 4D data or 3D over time data now, we're actually on the right hand side want to model how that flow of the different solutions is really taking place through this network and how that means that why do we get such a why do we get crystals growing where they're growing and why are they not growing in other locations that seem to be suitable? So again, there's a huge amount of like follow-on analysis that we can do to use the, the, that 3D uh, replica as a starting point for, for setting up our models. Okay, just a little uh, spotlight um, here on uh, one of the, I mentioned this color system that we're getting and Basically, it's a system built down at STFC. It's called the Hexitech. And what we're getting in the lab is a six by two array. So it'll actually be, you know, 640 pixels across um, the six elements. And you can see that we basically can crawl up to um, 2000 channels um, in, in, in the spectrum uh, dimension. And this is just an example here on the right. We've got here a grayscale image, which is mapping, uh, is a single slice from some CT data, looking at a printed uh, carbon substrate with platinum catalysis particles. But the color image on the right is showing, has been tuned to just pick out the platinum. 
And you can see that actually there's not an even distribution of the platinum across this, across this uh, substrate. So again, although we're not resolving the individual catalysis particles, we're actually being able to map this distribution of these particles across this sample. So again, the color imaging with that elemental distinction is being able to like help us understand how are these things being produced and why they're performing as, as they're performing. Okay. Now I'm going to move into a couple of like specific examples that are like challenges that are emerging right now in terms of just to give an idea of the scale of, of the data. So, for example, our new helical scanning system in the NXCT can acquire data sets that are up to 10 terabytes in size, because not only can we stitch in one dimension, we can have a very extended 20 to one aspect ratio sample, and that will be a single image of, of, of a sample. But at the moment, our computing capability means that we can reconstruct a maximum of one terabyte in size. Now, even when we do that, that's gonna be a significant challenge. That's gonna take a long time. And then once we've got a terabyte image, how are we gonna handle that? And also we need to be very, very careful that that is a worthwhile thing to do. So is there anything we can do to actually reduce that region of interest and sort of zoom in on something first? But there will be cases where we really want to have this really uh, large ratio between what is the very high resolution and a very large volume surveyed, but we really need effective ways to tackle this. And also there's a new beamline being developed at ESRF called BM18, and it's a multi-scale beamline, and it boasts a 20K detector. Now, if you are going to follow a Shannon Nyquist uh, sampling theorem to get the sort of even resolution across that whole volume, you'll need to collect around 30,000 projections. So 30,000 20K by 20K images means that a single image in this case will be 50 terabytes. And the guys at ESRF have already said that actually, if we can't do something with it straight away, we'll just have to delete it and then recollect it because we can't store lots of these images for any period of time. So either you use it or you lose it. So we need, again, really effective ways to firstly look at these things at all, but then to actually like do something quickly and effective with it. And I've just elaborated it here in terms of those two examples were just grayscale images. So if we have a grayscale image, we can multiply the total number of voxels that we've got by the number of bits in the grayscale. And in this example, I'll just create some examples of a 2000 by 2000 by 2000 volume of voxels. And how big would that data be if we have just the grayscale, 16 bit grayscale data, or if we have some crystallographic information, which is adding the 16 bit grayscale to the 24 bit orientation data, or at the bottom, we have the example of a spectral data. And you can see that 17 gigabytes, we can easily handle that with all of our current capabilities. 40 gigabytes, still fine, but more of a challenge. But at 3.6 terabytes, we've got a problem just to even do something sensible with that. We already need to do something to this to make this uh, possible to handle. And I'll just touch on this one example, which is uh, what, how the Large Hadron Collider Atlas detector handles some of this. And you can see that it creates this huge amount of data, one petabyte of raw data per second, which is completely unmanageable, even for those guys. So what they do is they use the various triggers to select events and they downsize it immediately. And you can see we've got three levels of triggers or three sort of filters applied to this data to reduce it down to just 100 megabytes of disk space per second compared to one petabyte per second. But still, even when you do that, you end up with at least one petabyte per year. But you can see they know enough about what they're doing to actually be able to remove the data that is not so important and keep the data that is important through those processes. So I think some really smart use of the data, but it makes us very nervous at the moment if we're getting rid of data that we've never seen. How can we, we be confident that we're doing the right thing? 
So in summary, um, X-ray imaging is incredibly versatile technique, um, but it is absolutely dependent on the advanced data processing to, to make it uh, uh, to, to, to work at all. And the increasing size and multi dimensions of our data sets are now creating a significant challenge. But I'd like to say this can really be used as a as one example, one use case, which will really address a lot of the generic challenges of multi-dimensional and large data. And through the NXCT, we can make data sets available. We can make X-ray CT scanner time available to support your research. So please come to us with your ideas if you think we can help either through some computing resources or through provision of data sets that we might already have and things like that. And so, yeah, I'll leave it there and say thanks uh, very much for listening.